God gave me There's only we got the sun That's how I survived in these dirty rotten slum These dirty rotten slum These dirty rotten slum God gave me There's only we got the sun Praise be Jesus Christ Now and forever Now and forever <laughs> How you doing, my brothers and sisters of Christ? Welcome to Sunday Readings with Charlie the Catholic. It's the third Sunday of Lent, and it's a special episode because today I got a guest, you know, and it's always a special episode when I have a guest and someone to, to come along with the, with the ride and, and, and dive into the scriptures with me. You know, this is a, a show where we go into the scripture readings for that particular Sunday, and we see what kind of message that God wants us to hear for those readings. You know, a fun fact, a lot of people don't know, Sunday is actually the first day of the week. You know, a lot of people think Monday is the first day, but actually it's Sunday. So this is how we're starting off the week with the Sunday readings so that we can take this with us throughout the week. Maybe you'll see this show on your time feed uh, and it's not Sunday. That don't mean nothing. You still watch the show and I'm sure there's still a, a message that the Lord wants you to hear, you know. Um so like I said, we have a guest today. When I reached out to this guy for uh, uh, to be a guest, he was like, wait, you know, I'm nobody big. I'm like, listen, I'm nobody big. We're no, nobody here is big. We're, we're here, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We all have a and share a, a love for the gospel and, and sharing the gospel and proclaiming it to others, you know, and we all have something in common and, and trying to, to Further the kingdom. What we do is something that's, you know, for the love of God. And today's guest is a friend of mine, Lawrence Gonzaga. I hope I pronounced your name right. Is that right? Yeah. My yes. friend Lawrence, he's uh, behind the scenes, you know, and he does a lot in his world. He's an intellectual, you know, a teacher, and, and he's a, above all, he's a Catholic. So that qualifies you in being a guest of my show. You know, so um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you guys to Lawrence. And Lawrence, I'd like to ask you, who are you and how did you become Catholic? Well, Charlie, thank you for having me and uh, thank you for inviting me. And I'm, I'm humbled to be uh, a guest on your show. I know you had uh, my associate, Dr. Robertson Jenis, uh, not too long ago. And so I thought, oh, well, Sounds like you have big, big names on your on your show. So I'm, I'm a nobody, but uh, but I, I will I will uh, I will humble myself to to your uh, to your uh, elevation, I guess you can say. And so, you know, I I was born and raised. Uh, I mean, I guess you can say born. I shouldn't say born. I mean, I, people say that all the time. You're not born Catholic, right? You're you're born a child of Satan, as they say in the old days, right? And it's baptism that makes us children of God, right? And then uh, confirmation makes us soldiers of Christ. So um, I was, uh, you know, raised in the Philippines, and a lot of that culture is very much Catholic by culture, right? And so, so we had the rosaries, we had the angelists. I mean, I knew all my pra all the prayers growing up. But I didn't. I didn't fully really understand the Catholic faith as I became an you know older child and and as a teenager. Uh, and my parents, um, when it came to the U.S., weren't 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 regular church going folks. My grandparents were. So I I, I was in the sphere of the church. I went to Catholic school, uh, second, third, fourth grade around there uh, at uh, Holy Family. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, in the Philippines? Schools? No, actually in, in Glendale, California. Oh. So I, was born, I was born in the Philippines, came here when I was five years old. Ah. Uh, so I had the cultural Philippine, you know, cultural Catholicism, but I didn't really understand it. And as I got older, there was a lot of more challenges to the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, I had Christian Christian Protestant. By that, I mean Protestant friends that were asking me questions about Catholicism. I didn't know how to answer them. And, uh, you know, it just became convenient to just become a practical atheist. Now, I, I still generally had a Catholic morality. I, I didn't go into, you know, drugs and, you know, debauchery and any of that right. stuff. Right. But but uh, I guess I was uh, generally a pretty good atheist for a couple of years until until I went to college. Um, I went to a local college here. It was a state college, uh, Cal State San Bernardino. And one of the professors there um, was a philosophy professor and 
typical among even state colleges, right? You'll talk about the pr proof for existence of God or the, or the arguments against the existence of God. So they're kind of fair on both sides. And then when, you know, we studied Thomas Aquinas, the five ways of Thomas Aquinas, yeah. we, we studied the, uh, the ontological argument of St. Anselm, uh, which is not, a, some would say is not a strong argument for the existence of God, but actually it's, it struck me as something that, you know, made me say, hmm, <laughs> Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I thought, okay, well, I guess there are intellectual arguments for the existence in support of the existence of God. And so my professor was an atheist, so he had no intention in making me Christian or Catholic. Uh, <laughs> but I ended up uh, believing, you know, by the grace of God. So it's not, I don't believe it's the intellectual arguments that made me Christian again, or reconverted me. Mm -hmm. it's, it was just a moment of grace. God used that moment to bring me out of this intellectual separation from the belief in, in God. And so I became Christian again. But, you know, I, I went back to the Catholic Church and I thought, you know, I asked all these questions and the, nobody really had any my answers. My family didn't know how to answer my questions. And Around this process. time, how old were you with this? With the well, I the professor. I would have. I would have been 19, probably okay. uh, around there, uh, 19 or 20. So it was my first year of college. Um, nice, because a lot of people, when they go to college, is where they lose the faith, you know, and especially <laughs> yeah. where, <clears throat> with encounters with atheistic professors. But <clears throat> sometimes God, you know, he works in mysterious ways, and he can even use an atheist to bring you closer to him, you know. And, and I've seen that happen countless times not only an atheist or maybe like in my case, you know, he used Protestants to bring me closer to the Catholic faith, you know, Protestants within my family, you know, makes you want to dig deeper into your roots. And, and like you say, uh, defend the faith and know how, what, what answer to give to those hard questions, you know? Yeah, that's actually a good point because uh, when I came back to the Catholic church, as I said, um, they didn't have a lot of answers. And so I, I was looking for like books to read and I found some books online about Catholicism, but it was apologetics against Catholicism. Wow. So when I, when I read those books, I thought, okay, the Catholic church is the whore of Babylon, <laughs> right? It's, it was one of those, it was one of those Jack Chick type books. Oh you know, yeah. You know who Jack yes. Chick is. Absolutely. So, um, so then, uh, then I went up North. I have fa a lot of Catholic family up, up North, Northern California. And I started using these anti-Catholic arguments against my family up there. And then uh, my, uh, one of my uncles is a Catholic deacon in the Nova Sordo. Nice. And, and uh, he, uh, I pray one day I could be a, a deacon in the Nova Sordo, God willing. But well, God willing. That's, that's a grace. And an uncle of mine who was a deacon, you know, he played a crucial role in my reversion. So, you know, I'm I'm happy to hear that. You have you had an uncle who was a deacon and what happened with him? Well, he uh he he didn't he didn't really uh take a lot of time to answer my questions, but he did say, <laughs> Hey, over in the other room there's a stack of books. Just there, there are multiple copies of those books, and actually, I have them here. I don't know if you can see it. Beginning yeah. apologetics. Yes. So he had one. This one was not really relevant. It's about Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. But this oh, really was awesome. the. This really was the book, and they still sell these books. Um, on um, I think Catholic Answers still sells them. Um, the newer versions. So basically, it, it, it answered enough of my questions to say, wait a minute, somebody was trying to pull the wool over my eyes. They were selectively choosing quotations from the Catechism of the Catholic Church to make it look like the Catholic Church was, was, uh, was satanic or was not Christian. Uh, and so that got me started. You know, it started with one Catholic book. And as you can see behind me, though, that's not a background. Those are... Those are Catholic, a lot of them are Catholic books. So, uh, you know, 15, uh, you know, 15, uh, what is it? But 17, 18 years now, you know, you know, one book led to two and led to a couple of thousand. So wow. <laughs> um, here it is. Not that I've read all of them. I'm not going to pretend like I read all of them, but, <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 it grew this, this thirst for more mm -hmm. understanding, a greater understanding of the Catholic faith. 
um, and defending the Catholic faith. I was kind of an online apologist for about 10 years. Yeah, that, that, that I can say for, for me as well is I was a amateur online apologist. You know, I'm really not qualified, but it really just engaging in debates. You know, it took a lot of time for me away from home, but and, and a lot of it, whether good or bad, you know, but during the time, it, it kept me on fire to dig in, you know, how to respond. I don't know how fruitful those, those debates were. I don't know if anyone was converted from them, but I know personally on my part, I became more solidified in my position. So uh, how did you, uh, you mentioned Robert Sejanis, who I was blessed to have as a guest. He's actually one of my favorites, if not the favorite Catholic apologist. You know, I think I mentioned that to him and um, I, I was blessed to have him as a guest. But how did you get introduced to him or, or, or how did you learn about his work? Well, in those days, uh, you know, you you just kind of Google Catholic apologetics and really two websites in, you know, 2005 would have come up. It would have been Catholic Answers mm-hmm. and it would be, uh, you know, uh, Catholic Apologetics International is what it was called in, in those days. And so I would read some of those articles. I found some of the debates and, and, and listen, you know, I started buying, you know, you know, his CDs and I would listen to them. And so I, and I actually invited him to come speak at my Knights of Columbus here. I was, I was an officer of the Knights of Columbus in 2007. And so he came out and gave us maybe four talks, something like that. I have them recorded and oh, they're, on, wow. they're online. Uh, and then we, we had him come back in 2009. And uh, we actually had a controversy with our local bishop here. Well, not really the bishop per se, but, uh, but you know, his kind of officers. Uh, oh, didn't yeah. Like, I didn't like the topic. Yes, right. And so, um, you know, his um, his chancellor at, of the diocese had had our event canceled at the Knights wow. of Columbus. They went oh, to the wait. top. They went to the state council and said, "Tell them to stop. We don't want them to speak." And uh, and so, you know, we had to scurry. We had to scramble and try to find an alternative. So so we we got a venue at the at the San Bernardino Police Department. So we we moved our event at the police department outside of the reach of the diocese, I guess you can say. And wow. we had eight, we had eighty people show up, so we it was fairly. Uh, well, well, eighty people, well, you had to operate outside the jurisdictions, you know. Yeah. Hey, man, that's something. What was the topic, if you don't mind me asking? Well, the topic that was the controversy was: uh, Does it is the old covenant still valid? So that the so that the Jewish people can still be saved by that covenant, and and you probably this must know have been that. around the time when when the Holy Father released that uh, statement saying uh, that the old covenant was still valid or something, right? Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, it wasn't the Vatican, but it, it was. It was the USCCB, and it was. Uh, I think it was Cardinal Bertoni or something like that. There was some ecumenical uh, statement. Uh, that said something along those lines that the that the that the um, covenant with with the Jewish people is still valid for them, which is of course a um, well from from Robert Genesis perspective a heresy. But but you know it's uh, that not, not only his perspective but the church all the way back to Trent. You know um, I know that is a controversial and touchy subject. You know so I, I know people like to shy away from it, but just to Keep it blunt and simple, you know, there's, Jesus says, I'm the way, right? The truth and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. Um, and as we know, they reject the, our Lord Jesus outright. True. Well, yeah, so so I won't want to, as, as controversial as that topic is, I really don't want to stay on there because I would hate to get the attention of my um bishops underlings you know and they might come trying to shut down sunday readings with charlie the catholic you know and that's the last thing i want to do i want to try to remain in their their good graces you know and and you know um i know after you 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 had robert and janice come over and, and speak i understand you you become uh, involved in working with them behind the scenes tell us about that 
Yeah. So ever since his first visit, um, I was driving him back to the airport and I said, hey, you should you should get away from selling tapes like cassette tapes. You know, maybe a lot of your audience don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's a cassette tape that you would play on a tape player had tape in it. Yeah. And then he had CDs. But, you know, even then CDs was kind of phasing out almost. Uh, I mean, as far as apologetics and stuff and his MP3s were becoming more unpopular. And I, was, I said, hey, you should switch over to MP3s. You don't have to bother shipping things and all that other effort. Right. And he was like, what's MP3? How do I even do that? I mean, he's, you know, he's a theologian and right, scripture scholar. Right. He doesn't have time to think about technology and stuff. So I said, well, I could do that. I could do that for you. So ever since that point, I started off just kind of doing you know, some techie type stuff. Yeah, like, like IT stuff, huh? Yeah, something like that, like transferring his tapes and making them MP3s and so we can sell them online. And then wow. his web his webmaster at the time, you know, got busy doing, you know, focusing on his family and his career and things like that. And, you know, I said, he asked me, can I take over the kind of the website stuff? And I said, well, I'm not a webmaster. I'm not trained in that stuff, but I can I can make do. So ever since 2007, I've kind of been running his website. Wow, so that's, it's, that's, it's, that's quite some time. And I'm, I got to thank you there because I have some of the MP3s from uh, Robert Agendas. Well, there you go. And, and you could tell it was taped previously too, but it, it's good to be to have it out there digitally, you know, and um, more power to you for that. You know, I, I would like to get into the readings for today. You know, it's the third Sunday of Lent. Um, the first reading is in the book of Exodus. And we're going to hear the holy name of God. Because Moses is told to go back to Pharaoh. And he asks him, who should I say send me? And we're going to hear the holy name of God, which is I am. Um, I know some people, you know, with the commandments. For example, the first commandments, there's only one God. You shouldn't have any graven images. Believe it or not, Protestants say that we take out that graven images, but that's actually part of the first commandment. They just split it to two. But now some people go and they take it all the way to the extreme and they say no graven images at all. You know, so, but then the, the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant has statues of angels on it, right? So then also there's a commandment where it says you should not take the Lord's name in vain, right? So now they take that. And they go to the extreme where they say you shouldn't even say the Lord's name at all. You know, so there's always an extreme of this. But we're going to hear today's reading, I am, which the Lord's name in Hebrew is Yahweh. And that's the holy name of the Father. And um, without further ado, we're going to get into the reading. We're at Exodus chapter 3. A reading from the book of Exodus. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Today's responsorial psalm, we're in Psalm 103. Praise of divine goodness. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. All right, now going over to today's second reading, we're in a letter from St. Paul, St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And it's a warning against overconfidence. I'm sure you might know there's some people that they teach once saved, always saved, or the perseverance of the saints. They have this overconfidence that they can never lose their salvation. Or let's have an attentive ear to what St. Paul has to say about that. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same supernatural food and all drank the same supernatural drink. For they drank from the supernatural rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things are warnings for us, not to desire evil as they did, nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as a warning, but they were written down for our instruction, upon whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so now we're going to get into today's gospel reading. I like to stand up. We're in Luke, a reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered thus? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Lo, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Let it alone, sir, this year also, till I dig about it and put on manure. And if it bears fruit next year, 
well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So Lawrence, in the first reading, we see Moses and he encounters with the Lord as a burning bush. I have a question for you. Does this mean, this is like a question my daughter will ask me. Is God a burning bush? How would you answer that? Well, that's a tough, <laughs> is God a burning bush? Um, well, he's, I would say he's not, he's not a burning bush, but it's, it, it was the means by which he communicated to, uh, right. It's, it, it was, I, I, you know, I'm not a scholar of the old Testament, but, right. but even, I think some would say it, it wasn't even the voice of God, right. Because you know, even, even, even hearing the voice of God in the context of the old Testament, I think it was, uh, you you would probably die, right? I think there's. That's so, why. Yeah. That's why when he heard it, he put his face. He didn't want to see God, even mm -hmm. because you know he would die. That that is true, right? And and if there's any accuracy to to the movies, right? <laughs> it's, I mean, I I think it was obviously trying to to describe what was actually described in 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 uh, in uh, Genesis, right? Exodus. Exodus, Exodus, sorry. Exodus, Exodus, right. Um, where where Moses' face was transformed, uh, you know, in, in, you to wear a veil. in the depiction of the movie, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, his hair turned white. I mean, his face was sort of bronzed almost, uh, if, if I'm not, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. So uh, is God the burning bush? Uh, he No, he's not the burning bush, but it's it was kind of a... Right. A, 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 a and he, it. Yes, he appeared in that form, just like, you know, like my, it, it stems from a question from my daughter, when the baptism of our Lord, the Holy Spirit descended as a dove. So she asks, is, is the Holy Spirit a dove? You know, and, and this is the same answer with the burning bush, you know, because also the Holy Spirit at Pentecost appears as tongues of fire. You know, this is the form that, that the Lord reveals himself to us. And that's also in Old Testament before the incarnation, before mm. God took flesh and appeared to us and the man of Jesus, Christ Jesus. And then uh, we're talking about St. Paul's letter. We're going to the second reading now. Uh, overconfidence, in, you know, and in, in one salvation. You have anything to say towards that? Right. So, uh, you know, you mentioned one saved, always saved earlier. And, uh, and I always like to just ask the question. Uh, because it typically they they don't know how to answer the question, uh, or they don't know, know, know the scripture I'm referring to. I, I think it is it, it's just a chapter just before this reading, where Paul was talking about how he 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 shadow boxes, he beats his body, and he and he runs the race, and he's 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 anxious about it because he doesn't know if if he actually will be disqualified. And and the Greek word there is adokimos, which actually means reprobate. Right. So somebody might say, well, you know, you could still, you know, try you, you should you, you could still have an assurance of salvation. But but um, it's not you know, it doesn't mean he's he's not saved. Well, reprobate only means one thing. You're, <laughs> you're excluded. You are excluded from the presence of God for all eternity. So he's he's nervous about it. So if if the great apostle St. Paul who is a greater apostle in the eyes of many Protestants than he, than Peter, our first Pope, uh, is not certain of his salvation, then who can be certain of their salvation? That's, that's a great point. You know, he says, Run. therefore, whoever thinks he is standing secure should take care not to fall. So, you know, um, it, it's, it's, it's almost like they, they get offended to, to, to think that they they could lose their salvation, almost as if that's a slight or, or, or a jab at Christ's finished work on the cross, which is not the case. You know, Christ's work is finished, but it's just us and our cooperation with his grace and enduring to the end, you know. And touching on this subject, you know, and, and on Robertson Janice, I have this book I would like to recommend a lot of people 
to read. It's a little thick, a lot of digesting to do, but it is great. It's a great resource, and, and I highly recommend you guys to get it. But uh, Lawrence, and in today's gospel reading, we see um, the Lord speaking of fruit. Of, of It's a parable there we hear. You have anything you want to add to that? Well, um, you know, I think it follows along the same um, theme as we read in 1 Corinthians, uh, the, the second reading, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where you don't, you can't be overly confident in your own salvation. Um, and, you know, all, all of, we know that passage, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, right? Right. And so um, we're all sinners, right? And so... Um, the important thing is the the um, the metanoia, right? The turning away from sin, the, right. the conversion, uh, and 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 orientation towards God, and that's that's a that's a daily struggle. I know for myself, it is. It's not myself, you know, I'm not, no. I'm not quite there yet, and, <laughs> uh, and that's the struggle, right? The the, the it's the tr what they call it triple concupiscence, right? Mm -hmm. Our co concupiscence is our is our affinity, our our uh, our tendency to be attracted to the world, the flesh, and the devil, right? That's the triple concupiscence, and that's that's part of our nature. And so we have to kind of keep ourselves, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the, the Paul saying he beats his body and he and he shadow boxes and he runs the race, and and you can't you can't let up. I mean. I mean, it, it's not like every day you're always thinking about, uh, right. you know. It's, it's, you have to other. find a balance because you could uh, fall into what's called, um, uh, you become scrupulous, you know. Scrupulous, right. You know, and you start to think everything's a sin and you're always bad, you know. But it's 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 a it's on the side of the grave. We got to always fight that concupiscence, that urge to, mm -hmm. to, to sin. We got every day when you wake up, it's an opportunity to repent as every day is an opportunity to defeat the devil. Because I'm pretty sure you could attest to this on a daily basis. The devil's attacking and always trying to tempt us to sin, too. It's always it's a, a battle between not only the devil, but the flesh. So that's yourself trying to sin. And, you know, as you see in today's gospel reading. It's a call for repentance and repenting to repent is to turn away from sin. Like you're saying, and and Jesus mentions, you know, the people that died, uh, a, a silo fell on them, and people question if something bad happened to you, they you you might think this is God punishing you that you know you're or this is because you're a sinner, but God's mercy is good, and it is not because they're more of a sinner than the next person. You know, we just everyone's going to experience suffering regardless. And one thing I like to mention and that is. The suffering we experience in this side of the grave could be redemptive suffering. If we offer it up, it could be our purgatory on this side of the grave, you know? And I like to mention that to everybody. I, I'm going through some suffering as well. And it's something I offer up on a daily basis. And like I always say, I always ask you guys to pray for me. I always pray for you, you know? And it's something that we have to deal with on this side of the grave. We're not gonna have heaven or paradise until you know, we pass to the other life, you know? Amen. That's true. I, it, it, that last, uh, that last pass, uh, that last uh, um, um, passage there on, on verse nine or verse eight through nine. Uh -huh. um, and I'm not, I'm not an exegete. I'm not a biblical scholar like Dr. Sengenis, but I, for, for me, what, what, what that's trying to convey to me is that God has the sort of the wisdom to know when we're meant to bear the fruit right and so if if sometimes on a human side of things we we make judgments it's part of our sort of human nature to be judgy sometimes right. but we have to be careful right we can't be judged to you know, overly judgmental of other individuals it, it, you know judge not lest ye be judged that doesn't mean we shouldn't judge right because even paul says judge don't judge those outside of the church let god judge them that's right. Judge, judge those inside the church, right? Because we have to make, you have to surround ourselves with with individuals that will uplift us and help us in our struggle. 
and, and not bring us down. So we have to make that kind of judgment. But but here it ta- it's talking uh, about the fruit, right? Sometimes we might we might be overly judgy of, of our brothers and sisters and say, well, they're not bearing fruit. Uh, but we don't have the insights of God, right? God might say, well, their fruit might come later, right? So, right. so he says, wait a year. And then if there's fruit, then, uh, you know, it's it's a good tree. If it's not, you know. <laughs> it, right. That's a, a great, that's a good point. And you know how this also speaks to me is something that, that might catch someone off guard is when you tell them God's mercy has a limit, you know, on this side of the grave, his mercy is unlimited. But once you're at, the judgment seat that's it your time for repentance that limit is up and you know i think that's also something that's being said here is you know time is limited to repent so this is a call for repentance you know and um yeah as far as bearing fruit that's that's god's grace that makes the fruit bear anyways and you know i um i just want to close real quick before we go you know, I got, uh, speaking of bearing fruit, I had the website and I have gifts on the, that you could bear gifts for yourself or someone else. You can go to charliethecatholic.com. And if you do, you know, you make a purchase, you'll get a package like this in the mail. And you just probably see my little logo right there. It's just a way of trying to help the show, uh, try to proclaim the gospel or do whatever we can to help. I, I don't have um Patreon. I don't have a Patreon account. I opted to do the, the website and have some merch. I can customize gifts and everything. But uh, you know, like the blanket and everything. And, and as you see, I got also new jewelry available. You know, it's it's uh, my slogan is wear your faith, share your faith. So, you know, hopefully that's the way you guys could uh bear fruit and sh- and share the fruit. Anyways, Lawrence, I'd like to thank you for being an awesome guest. You know, like every time I have a guest, the one of the biggest challenges is to find where to end. The because I can keep going, you know, I can keep going, and I look forward to having our future guests come on the show. I'm sure we have a mutual friend, uh, Joe. You know, Joe Morex. He's out there in California. He's a good friend of mine. I've been trying to get him on for a while. He got uh, the cup of Joe. He got little Halo. Uh, web ministry and, and anyone who got anything to that has anything to do with the faith i want to try to put this platform open for them you know and anyone watching this video if you're interested on in being the guest just send me an inbox we'll set it up you know and we'll go through the readers you could be a guest on sunday readers with charlie the catholic i look forward to having you guys on i have a friend of mine who's a eastern catholic you know, maybe we could go into the Eastern Rites, a Byzantine, because everyone thinks it's just Roman Catholic, but there's more than Roman Catholic, you know? But yeah, yeah thanks, you. Lawrence, for being the guest. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on. God, God bless your ministry. Thank you. Well, God willing, guys, uh, I'll see you guys next week. Thank you to everyone who likes and shares, and yeah, take care. God gave me his only begotten son. Hey, yo, no matter what I'm in, he's my Lord, my friend, my Savior, who died for my sins, and truly we need him, they brutally beat him, until he was bleeding, until I would see him, then I would believe in, he was born of a virgin to the thorns he was wearing, and I swore I would serve him, but I slacked